Good afternoon or good morning to you, uh, depending on where you are in the country. My name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Thank you for attending this session, A New Normal, Learning to Live with COVID. Uh, this is a live uh, activity. You can access this conversation through Zoom, or you can also go to uh, NCHPH Facebook, uh, Facebook page, and uh, we are streaming live. And if you are planning to attend the session on, uh, on, on Facebook, and if you have any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to do it. And then uh, we are going to be uh, able to to provide the questions to, to Zara Marcellian, who is not, uh, our speaker for today's activity. This is a little bit more informal than a webinar. It's just a conversation that we are going to have with Zara uh, regarding some issues, how uh, La Maestra Health Center is preparing for the uh, post COVID-19 pandemic or the endemic or the new era after COVID. Uh, some Zoom housekeeping instructions. At this moment, all participants are muted. If you would like to ask a question, uh, you can use the, the uh, chat box or you can also use the hand raise icon and your line will be unmuted if you would like to ask your question verbally. Uh, if you would like to turn your camera on, please feel free to do it. Uh, we are always happy to see your faces and making sure that we know each other. Um, the, again, this activity is live and is being recorded. And all the resources that we are planning to discuss today will be sent to you via email. And you can also access them uh, if you go to the NCHPH website, www nchph.org and, and the resources, the recording and the slides will be there. The National Center for Healthy Public Housing uh, is funded by HERSA to provide training and technical assistance to community health centers. Uh, we emphasize uh, our training on health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing. And we are funded by HERSA to provide these uh, training and technical assistance. Today, uh, we are planning to discuss uh, some items uh, with uh, Zara Marcellian. Uh, provide, uh, she will be providing an overview of La Maestra and she's going to list uh, some lessons learned from a historical perspective. She'll examine what La Maestra Health Center is, uh, has done to adapt to an uh, endemic COVID-19. Uh, she will be discussing the future of virtual and on-site visits for La Maestra Community Health Centers, and she'll be listing some strategies to maintain and improve primary health services during COVID. Just a quick reminder, uh, this is the most recent uh, UDS data, uh, over 1,300 uh, qualified health centers provided services to over 28 million patients, 435 health centers are located in or immediately accessible to public housing, and they provide services, uh, provided services to over 5 million patients. 107 of the 485 uh, um, health centers are public housing primary care grantees, and they provided services to almost 900,000 patients. This is the most recent uh, data from UDS. This is uh, 2020 data. Again, uh, there are almost uh, 1.7 million residents, uh, public housing residents. Uh, there is uh, some information that is important and that I always like to mention that 35% of them are um, senior patients or, or senior uh, uh, residents over the age of 65 and 38% of the households uh, report at least one person with a, one or more disabilities. 95% are, um, uh, are low income or, or um, and the uh, other information that is extremely important that I like to mention is that the 50% of them have less than high, uh, less than high school uh, diploma. So uh, it's really important to to mention all these uh, characteristics when we are analyzing uh, social determinants of health, 
uh, the uh, health literacy level and everything that you need to know when you are providing services to public house and residents. Some analysis, uh, this is COVID-19 data uh, around 4.85 of uh, public house and residents are fully vaccinated. And according to the latest information from HUD, 33% of all HUD assisted adults have reported three or more vaccines. Um, nine, over nine, 19,000 patients have been tested for COVID and 38, and 38 public housing primary care grantees are hosting mobile bands, pop-ups and school-based clinics to offer services, COVID-19 services to patients. Uh, uh, 11 uh, public housing primary care grantees have distributed a 95 masks to residents of public housing are on individuals experiencing homelessness. HUD is working with uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to obtain additional data on the conditions affecting public house and residents. And as you can see here, uh, patients uh, receiving uh, assistance from HUD uh, are more likely to have diabetes, COPD, asthma, have uh, want, uh, any type of disability and being overweight. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Zara Marcellian. Zara is, uh, Zara is the president of Zara Marcellian Consulting. She provides technical assistance through monographs, webinars, and consultation for health center program, program grantees and other nonprofit services providers nationwide on various topics that affect the health of culturally diverse low income public housing residents, older adults and other special populations. She is also the founder of and president at, and chief executive officer of La Maestra Family Clinic and nonprofit 501c, a federally qualified health center that serves over 48,000 underserved individuals annually across some of the lowest income and the diverse region of San Diego County, California. For the past 29 years, La Maestra has been dedicated to improving access and quality by providing primary and specialty healthcare as well on, as on, on on-site upstream social services for all individuals, regardless of their abilities to pay. Dr. Marcellian received a PhD in leadership studies from the University of San Diego she holds a Master of Arts in Organizational Development uh, from the Phoenix University and a BA in Sociology with a minor in Psychology from San Diego State University. Hello, Zara, and good afternoon. Hello, Dr. Leon. So nice to be with you today. Thank you so much, uh, Zara. Um, Zara, I would like to have this more like a conversation. Uh, so our uh, attendees can chime in on, uh, have uh, questions or share their experiences as well, with what they are doing, what they are, how they face Facebook, what, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, COVID, and what, what challenges they had during COVID and how they are preparing for the post-COVID era. So uh, I would like to get started and just ask you about if you can provide an overview of La Maestra so people are familiar with all the activities, the location, the clinics, the services that you provide. Great, that would be wonderful. Well, I think if we could put up the slide of La Maestra Circle of Care model, that would help a lot. I would do that. Great. So um, thank you again for this opportunity. It's always wonderful to share our experiences and hear you know, other lessons learned from other health centers across the nation. Um, and I just think that this is a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to acknowledge how uh, flexible, adaptive uh, health centers are um, to be able to pivot quickly, you know, as, as COVID, you know, descended on us uh, and be able to develop new strategies and so forth. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on to that and La Maestra's experience during COVID. Um, but I did want to provide you with some background of the model of care that's been developed over 34 years at La Maestra. We're located in City Heights, which is in San Diego. 
Um, and, uh, and then we have like 17 other sites in San Diego County. We started actually as a nonprofit educational uh, facility back in 1986. And from that, you know, we had 12,000 students that were preparing for the amnesty program under the uh, Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. We assisted people to, um, you know, with their applications for immigration. We provided them English as a second language, vocational training, and the, then the programs kept developing depending on the need of the students. And one of the uh, big needs that was, uh, you know, voiced strongly within our 12,000 students was they, they needed access to culturally competent health care in their communities. And so La Maestra Family Clinic uh, basically started in 1990, and we kept a lot of the social, what's called now social determinants programs around economic development, housing, youth development, food scarcity, um, and we kept growing those, those uh, services along with our FQHC. And so here we are, how many years? You can see the different petals represent the, you know, the main sections of the circle of care, and it's an integrated holistic model focuses on the whole person and not just the person, but their family. Right. And um, <clears throat> and it's and again, it's around all of the medical, dental, behavioral health, uh, mental health, all of those wonderful programs, comprehensive services. And then you have a. Uh, the supportive services, eligibility, transportation, translation. We have you know over 30 languages at City Heights and you know in our other areas in San Diego that we have clinics. Then we have a program specifically for economic development um, that we've grown all of these years and um, environmental health as well, housing, and of course, nutrition, health education. And so forth. It's um, our programs in, uh, I would say, you know, in alignment with how our FQHC has grown is because we know that health and well being needs more than just a trip to the doctor. It's important to know if somebody's living in their car, they're homeless, they don't have access to nutritious food because all of our sites obviously are in, you know, uh, food deserts, food swamps. So that, that is very impactful on the health and well being of our patients. So, um, we provide as many of those services as we can within La Maestra Circle of Care. And we've also developed over 34 years a very comprehensive network of collaborations in these other sectors aside from healthcare. And that's been, uh, I think a, a tremendous benefit to our patients and clients, because if we can't provide the services, we have partners that can uh, bring in those resources and, and we already have referral systems in place with them. And again, it's, it's an effort over 34 years and we'll continue to, um, to grow those uh, networks to increase the pathways for our community patients to be able to you know, go outside the community to our partners for services that we can't provide within the community. So that um, kind of gives you a basic overview of our uh, integrated model, taking primary health care, specialty services, and then adding the, um, the complement of those social determinants programs. And we've developed our IT uh, platforms to basically house the, um, the data and be able to, you know, call reports from those social determinants referrals and um, right, right within our EHR. So that's, uh, that's been, again, a, a, a long, a long work that we've been able to, to stay on. And uh, obviously we have to keep improving it, but I, I feel really good that, you know, we have this model that is providing that health and well-being, um, you know, focus, and it's really provided now a supportive network for 
our community. And we see that as COVID hit, um, you know, people accessing us for, you know, just basic information, resources of information, what's happening, what can I do? How can I um, protect myself and my family from getting sick? Um, what's the new guidelines? Uh, what about the PPE? You know, when should I wear the masks? And what do I do about my mom who has a coexisting condition? So all of this um, wonderful, I guess, or relationships that we have with our patients, not just for healthcare services, but around these other programs like human trafficking assistance, domestic violence, youth programs, food scarcity, senior programs, home health visits. Those are all access points and school-based you know, clinics. They're all access points. And that's super important because then patients can access you know, trusted uh, you know, sources of information at, at our organization during these times of crisis. And many of our populations already felt isolated, marginalized, seniors, youth, um, you know, victims of violent crime. And so you can imagine then when COVID hit and with the social distancing and isolation, it just added more levels of complexity to already a very complicated, um, you know, situation with a lot of challenges that people faced on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. So uh, I feel like our health centers are, you know, that supportive system for people. And, um, and, and that's, that's shown to be very important and, and helped us move quite quickly about, you know, for our strategies on outreach, um, health education, uh, when it was time for, you know, obviously the vaccines, the boosters, before that, the testing, getting that information out was uh, much easier because we do have already these pathways established of communication and resource sharing, you know, across sectors, not just healthcare. So that was uh, our reach then to deliver that message, those, you know, that outreach was uh, really important. Thank you, Zara. That's a great, great overview. And uh, just let me go back for a moment to the uh, slides. And I remember you know, having a conversation with you a long time ago about emergency preparedness. And uh, I remember La Maestra being one of the pioneers on how to start preparing for all these emergencies. I remember you uh, uh, having conversation with other uh, FQACs and other agencies and, uh, about uh, Ebola, about uh, chikungunya, about Zika. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I know that La Maestra has always prepared in advance for all these uh, natural and human-made uh, disasters. So what, what, what lessons learned from a historical perspective you can uh, discuss with us uh, uh, on everything that La Maestra has done through all these years to prepare before and after uh, or during COVID? Well, thank you, Jose. I don't think that anybody can ever be completely re you know, prepared, but certainly uh, those other historical events have really gave us um, you know, good, a good, uh, I guess, experience with, you know, what, how, how do we react as an organization? How can we um, not just react, but how, what can we do to prepare? We'd already gone through um, the exercise, you know, with the Ebola uh, scare, um, you know, setting up the tents outside, doing the screening, uh, the PPE, you know, it, and developing new uh, policies and procedures, new pathways for people entering our sites, um, you know, the basic survey, you know, before they enter the questions that they're answering. Um, that was all super important. As, and also, of course, being connected with other first responders in the community, and then being able to think about how do we share the new information 
and the new guidance, the new mandates with our community. And um, our community partner can disperse the information quickly. So uh, that really did help us, you know, um, I guess be semi prepared for COVID. Um, and and so, yes, you know, when, when uh, what was it, March of 2020, and uh, COVID to adopt those same strategies, you know, how do you redesign your workflow? Uh, what about the space? You're not going to have a lot of people waiting in the waiting rooms if you're supposed to be socially distancing. Um, and then the PPE and experiencing, uh, you know, like everybody else, initially, you know, there was panic about, you know, PPE shortages. How are we going to make sure enough um, protective gear to keep and our staff safe. Our staff are just wonderful. They were, they were showing up every day, despite, you know, living under the fear uh, uh, that the rest of the community and society was under, you know, like what's going to happen. And so they, they were there. We were able to continue providing them the PPE. Um, information again about the new regulatory agencies, our county, our state as well, participating in, you know, when the vaccines came along, you know, how do you do your reporting? Where are you going to get your vaccines from? Um, all of that was, you know, really working with our vendors, uh, trying to get donations from foundations and, um, and companies to support our efforts. And, uh, you know, that, that was, I guess, a huge, I mean, that, that, that was a huge effort, uh, keeping everybody safe and being able to disperse that information, whatever new uh, guidelines were coming down the pipe. And, uh, and then again, being able to adapt quickly based on new information coming in, you know, about, okay, this is what we need to do, you know, if people, if employees test positive, for example, you know, uh, now, uh, what are the new protocols around that? Uh, what about those employees that didn't want to receive the vaccine initially, or the boosters, you know, what, how all of that needed to be, um, you know, discussed, talked about, uh, decided, and of course, be in compliance with all of the regulations, right? So, and, and, and quickly, because that's what happens during emergencies, right? You start reaching out to your partners, um, your coalitions and your vendors, and uh, just to be able to have uh, the resources that you need at the clinic. And of course, work with your community partners as well, ethnic-based organizations. Um, work those uh, outreach programs, those promotoras, the cultural liaisons, to be able to not only disperse the information into the community, but hear from the community what their ongoing concerns and um, issues are in dealing with this pandemic. Thank you, Zara. Um, I am glad that you're mentioning the CHWs and your, uh, uh, the uh, community liaisons uh, because La Maestra has a such a diverse population. Uh, uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, La Maestra and I walk around just to see the community and the neighborhood and I see people from basically all over the world. So I am quite sure that that was a challenge to provide mm -hmm. COVID-19 information to all these uh, populations who speak different languages and sometimes they do not have uh, the ability to communicate in English. So uh, what is what was the experience, uh, you know, trying to provide uh, the information as quick as possibly mm -hmm. during, the, during the pandemic? Well, communication, as we know, is, is huge, you know, with the staff, with the patients, with the community, and again, being that supportive network and already having trusted relationships with the populations that we serve, right? And, and we employ because La Maestra is proud that we have like 750 employees. Majority are from the populations that we serve. 
So you have that cultural alignment already. And, and then the, uh, you know, the entities in our communities from all different sectors that we partner with normally, we were able then to impart this information as it's coming out about the pandemic, about the responses, uh, guidelines, mandates right away. And, um, and, and those cultural liaisons were awesome because they are from the populations, obviously, that we serve, the different language groups. And when you're talking about, you know, access to care, I mean, you have populations that were like really scared to come into the clinic, right? They're scared to get out of their house, the seniors, other people with coexisting conditions. They were um, petrified. And so what could we do to um, still keep them connected, accessing services? Uh, and that and, and that became part of our uh, uh, focus to develop new strategies, you know, on a day to day basis. So, for example, our pharmacies that we have in house then started um, doing more home deliveries in different areas. So people didn't have to go out to the pharmacy. Uh, we also provided tr more transportation, not just for patients. Uh, who were afraid to get on the public transportation system because of the you know infection and so forth, they uh, we were able to provide transportation not to all patients obviously, but to the seniors and people with coexisting conditions uh, that were you know really challenged to access services that did help as well as to staff who travel um, to come to work. And again, they were worried about uh, not being able to take the public transportation there for a while. And uh, we sent our vans out there and we did pickups and drop offs. And to this day, we're still offering that to some of our employees, you know, who still need that uh, that that assistance to get to to work. Um, and going back to the cultural liaisons, you know, it's uh, it, it's. It's, I think it's extremely valuable to employ staff to uh, help them continue their career development through certifications, advanced education, um, keep them growing right along with the organization. And, and there's such, a, they bring such wealth because they then educate the providers and all of the staff who are not familiar, for example, with their culture um, and their beliefs and um, and and the way that that they prefer or or need to have that information uh, delivered, right? So whether it's around preventative care services, um, like you know you take uh, mammogram services, uh, we that which we do provide and uh, breast biopsies and so forth. Uh, you know, not every culture really wants that same uh, health education delivered in the same manner. We have cultures who don't want or don't feel comfortable with and won't attend then different events in the community around health education, around breast cancer, if, if both genders are present. So, of course, you, you need to understand that uh, as 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 a provider who's trying to, um, you know, impart information about health screenings and preventative services really important to be aware about that. Now, that's just one example, okay? Um, and of course, during the pandemic, we had the uh, the Afghan Parolees also being resettled. La Maestra is a resettlement agency um, for Afghan Parolees. And, uh, you know, and, and that again, brought its own level of complexities because many were being released from the military bases into the communities and uh, some had COVID. And so then, you know, it's like, what do we do with our staff that are going to pick them up at the airport, taking them to, you know, their um, their hotel to start with, and then looking for permanent housing, um, helping them with a myriad of services, eligibility, food, you name it. So again, how do we keep those staff safe? Now we have some, the Ukrainians who are coming in. So <clears throat> it's not just dealing with a static situation. You know, emergency preparedness isn't just like, okay, what do we do with the people that we've been serving? It's okay, who else now is 
coming into our communities? How do we help them, right? Uh, how do we embrace those additional cultures uh, and, uh, and work with them? So that's, that's that constant being able to have adaptive leadership and, and, and changing course of direction or adding new programs and so forth. So uh, yeah, I mean, emergency preparedness was uh, very important. Um, and I'm so glad we did that, that, that work on it, you know, up to, to COVID. And of course we're continuing on. Um, and now we're seeing, okay, emergency preparedness also includes, you know, of course the fires out here in San Diego every year, um, you know, the power outages because of the fires, excessive heat, how does that affect people, chronic disease, you know, and so on and so forth, and tie that into the home visits to make sure that, you know, people um, who have asthma or hypertension or diabetes, of um, their home environment um, that they can obtain, like, you know, for example, with the diabetics, you have to have the insulin, you have to be able to store it. If your refrigerator doesn't work properly, how's that gonna, you know, affect the treatment? So um, again, it, it's tying in all of our different programs uh, and making sure that they also are aware uh, of, new information that um, that we're trying to share on a daily basis. And we developed an app, La Maestra app, for people that, um, you know, can access on their phone. They can get a copy right there um, through their portal of, uh, you know, their vaccine card and also, you know, the new health education, the reminders, you know, the text programs, you know, where we're texting them about their preventative services, their visits and so forth. So um, it's using social media, social media platforms. Yeah, it's just uh, all encompassing, I'll say. <laughs> Thank you, Zara. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, uh, I'm hearing, you know, that you all are now are having the, uh, uh, you're having people from Ukraine also. So it's, it's, I'm glad to hear that La Maestra is always ready to provide the health services, you know, that they need. Uh, during these difficult times. Um, now, moving uh, on, uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, COVID, you know, how COVID uh, has affected primary care in general, you know, the way that we are providing services, uh, the uh, fear that some people experience uh, in the very beginning you know, to go to the clinics and just leave in uh, the opportunity to get vaccinated or to uh, get their uh, mammogram or the cervical cancer screening. So it's, it's been a challenge for health centers to provide uh, services during COVID. And on top of that, uh, and this is something that we are planning to discuss in a few weeks uh, uh, regarding the workforce and how COVID has affected uh, our workforce. But uh, how La Maestra, or what La Maestra has done to adapt, you know, now we are hopefully moving from the pandemic to a new era where we are going to have COVID cases, but we are still, we are still going to need uh, our infection control guidelines, we're still going to need to reach out to our patients, to communicate with them in person. So how are you adapting now? How are you changing, you know, the emergency phase to a new phase? Right, well, I think that, you know, for us, we, we've developed that, you know, really highly trained, skilled, like COVID case management, right? Just like we have case management for other, um, you know, illnesses and so forth uh, or epidemics now um, and and how we incorporate that and keep the again the you know upcoming information about you know the treatments that like for example that are going to be rolled out and it they're complicated they're new how do we keep our providers informed uh, how do we keep the staff informed how do we incorporate all of those new protocols um, and, and that's going to be ongoing, right? Um, and 
and again, it's, um, I think just keep being, keeping that team, keeping the focus on how do we, as we emerge from this pandemic and whatever, like you said, the COVID, you know, variants that are going to remain are going to come around as we're seeing now. Um, how do we keep those same strategies in place and yet incorporate these new uh, these new guidelines or new events uh, and still pay attention to obviously the quality of services, meeting the heatest measures, which is really difficult because uh, populations haven't wanted to come in for those preventative visits, right? Um, and there some 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 are still uh, hesitant. And so what we've done is uh, during this time we have expanded our home health visits around the chronic diseases. So we have you know asthma mitigation program that goes into the house. It's a team, right? Um, also for seniors. Uh, so you're able to then to look at that. At, at the patient in their home environment, their surroundings, and basically then be able to provide resources aside from the direct medical services, those preventative services, the, you know, the pharmacy, so forth, but also look at the other social determinants in their home that are going to interfere with their health. So that's one strategy that we have been continuing to develop and will you know, move forward with with telehealth thank goodness we uh la maestra was interested and did develop a lot around telehealth i would say about 15 20 years ago we started with you know having these 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 carts you know and and have uh developed the network with specialty providers so that specialists wouldn't have to travel down to our sites right or our patients have to go outside their communities up to specialty services and, um, and yet they could do all of this through telehealth. So that was awesome because as COVID hit, well, you had to start doing a lot more virtual visits, uh, telephonic visits. Um, and then how about the staff working remotely? For a while there, you know, uh, the providers were working remotely. Um, some still came into the clinic. And then, you know, again, it's making those modifications and being comfortable with virtual visits that then okay if, if then tomorrow let's say we have to go back to more virtual visits then we're ready because we already have those uh workflows developed we've already tested them we've already been working with them so that really did help us be able to pivot and um and then use more you know e-health uh solutions like we have blood pressure cuffs that we've, um, you know, through a program where we have given these blood pressure cuffs out to different, you know, patients, hypertensive patients and so forth, that then we can, you know, it's a pilot also with the glucose monitors. So doing more e-health for people in their home and being able to monitor them. Uh, and keep that case management so they can reach the nurse. The nurse can right away reach out to them under the direction of the care team, which is, of course, the provider, um, and, and making sure that, that these folks are getting the services that they need. Uh, so we're going to expand more of those home health care team services. We also have our mobile clinics that have been extremely helpful, especially during the pandemic, um, you know, going to like say big, big uh, centers along with our other partners, you know, the county, the city, um, around the, the unhoused populations. So um, not just going to the different camps, but also to these big convention centers uh, and providing the mobile services there. And then connecting them to other services as well. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just not waiting for people to come into our sites. It's actually taking services out into the community. So we'll be continuing along with those programs. We also have uh, partnerships with the, um, you know, incarcerated uh, agencies, the jails, the prisons, um, where we pre-COVID were taking out our mobile clinics 
mobile mammography, um, providing mental health uh, services, um, connecting people that are from the reentry population as they come out into society into transitional housing, working with law enforcement, probation, um, mental health services in general, and connecting again people into these supportive services for their recovery. We will continue to do more of that now as well. Um, it's you know it's again keeping the pulse on who's 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 in your population base and are we reaching out to them and how are how are we making sure that they have the same access to all of the services and what do we need to change um, from a leadership perspective to enhance those access points. Thank you, Thank you. The, that's great information. And uh, uh, I'm glad that also that you mentioned the uh, virtual visits and the technology. You know, I heard you talking about an app where uh, 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 this is a vehicle to communicate with patients as well as the portals. And uh, we are moving to a, a very virtual uh, kind of uh, primary care. Um, it will, it will need extra funding opportunities. It will need, uh, you know, the collaboration with the state and federal organizations as well. Um, health literacy will be an issue, you know, making sure that patients understand how to use uh, all these technology. And uh, in addition, uh, it's, it's important to notice that um, that uh, some patients uh, prefer the in-person communication to, to get you know that contact with, with the doctor. So that's, that's, that's going to be um, uh, uh, some of the uh, new items, I guess, I guess. you know The other thing is uh, the ability you know, to provide those services to those who do not speak English, that, that they have that, that, that issue as well. So it's it is it, it's, it's challenging, and we are. I'm just hearing and reading sometimes that the future of uh, a AI, you know, artificial intelligence. So we are moving very fast to these uh, virtual visits and everything that we uh, that, that, that we are seeing, you know. And uh, I would like to know what is the future of virtual and on-site visit uh, for La Maestra. Uh, I mean, how are you balancing that out? Well, it's still a hybrid model. Um, and, you know, I can say that, you know, most of the staff and providers are back in person, but there will be uh, different departments that, you know, don't interact with uh, patients on a day to day basis. They don't need to be coming into the office. They can continue working remote. You know, maybe they take turns, you know, once a, once a week, they'll come in, then they'll stagger it with another staff member. You know, I'm talking about, you know, the billers, administrative functions and so forth. You know, gone are the days of all of these, you know, back to back in person meetings, right, that we all had. And we've all had to make that change in terms of, you know, how, how, how do we like today is an example, you know, I'm not there in person. Right. Uh, and uh, and 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 yet the the information has to be. Uh, readily available and being able to be pushed out to uh, to share um, through these you know different modalities and also for patients like you mentioned it's super important you know not everybody has access to you know laptops not everybody has access or or knows or has the literacy skills um, and so we've done um, you know different different training programs. Uh, around even just setting up, you know, we all as health centers had that experience with uh, getting patients to register for, you know, their portals. Well, if they don't have an email, then they can't get the portal. They can't have access to the portal. Well, how do they do that? So we've been for years now providing that educational literacy around, you know, for those patients. Um, I wanted to say also coming up with other strategies like for our mental health patients, you know, they are for visits, they, we've had uh, during the pandemic, uh, people who make, they, they have access to the telephone and they wanna have the telephonic visit, 
but they really are were not in a space where they could have share confidential information. Maybe they live in an apartment and they're sharing it with you know how many other people. So um, we developed kiosks um, in our clinic sites that have the laptop that have access to these um, telehealth visits and um, and has the equipment, has staff there to help them connect and gives them the privacy to be able to feel comfortable sharing this confidential information. I mean, one of the greatest needs during this pandemic, uh, uh, you know, looking back and we noticed it as we were moving along is the need for mental health services and behavioral health services. And that's something that's going to continue on. The effects of COVID have, have been really devastating for people. In addition to the challenges that our vulnerable populations face on a daily basis. So, you know, what can we do to, again, increase the access and, and, and how to utilize these other modalities um, and, and teach people and, and basically help them. And once they, once they know and they learn, then, they, then that's, that's another access point. So that's, we're keeping up on, on all of that. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. And uh, I, I'd like to mention that uh, I've been, uh, I mean, I've had uh, a long working uh, relationship with uh, Dr. Marcellian. Uh, she is part of the uh, advisory group and she always provides some information to NCHPH about needs. And I remember a long time ago, talking to you about telemedicine before COVID, uh, we were discussing about uh, some patients with hep C, you yes. know, and the ability that you had to, to somehow uh, those difficult cases to have the ability to talk to a specialist. Right. Hep C, and, and that was like five years ago or probably more. Mm -hmm. So uh, telemedicine has been there, it's going to be there, and it's going to stay there. So um, uh, I, I do remember, and I just want to say that, you know, that uh, hep, we were discussing hep C and those uh, uh, severe cases or very difficult cases, and you were off, but well, the maestro was offering, you know, the telemedicine option during that time. Sure, because a lot of the specialists obviously cannot come into clinic every day, right, or every week. And, and I, I will just use that um, example that you brought up. We'll say we, had, uh, we have a liver clinic, just like we have diabetes clinic, hypertension clinic, asthma clinic. And what you were referring to was the hepatitis B and C screening and treatment and and. and you know, we had the blessing of being able to uh, meet Dr. Gish. He's a world-renowned um, hepatologist. And um, yeah, and he is, and he's got other specialties too. And he uh, helped us set up our liver clinic and train our primary care providers on how to manage patients with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, liver disease, within the primary care realm. And as we have imaging services at La Maestra, he was able also to provide that training to our radiologists um, to, to know that you know when they're taking the image of the liver and make sure to include the neck of the liver because that's the important part to see and to gauge you know, with uh, you know, managing liver disease and, and so forth, the markers. And it was like, it, we're always learning every day, but you know, having access to people that have these this expertise and bringing it into the community is awesome. And telehealth is definitely a vehicle for that. Thank you, Zara. Um, we are um, running out of time, but uh, uh, I just I would like you to just discuss a little bit about the strategy strategies to maintain and improve the primary health services during COVID. You already uh, talked about um, the telehealth services, but um, in regards to, uh, there are several studies, you know, um, on how to protect your workforce and protect your patients. 
and the expansion of telehealth services and in-person visits. And uh, you've been basically discussing all these, but uh, in regards to the workforce, and we are going to have an hour and uh, next few weeks uh, about uh, how to protect your workforce, but what have you done, you know, and what are you planning to do in the future uh, to protect your workforce for future um, um, emergencies like the one that we're living? Well, uh, you know, that, that, that is a, a huge topic. And I think if we look back on lessons learned during this COVID and ongoing, what are some of the challenges with our workforce? Um, you know, it, aside from, you know, safety and, you know, with the PPE and making sure that, you know, all the mandates are followed, I think, you know, it mirrors with the staff mirrors what we face with the community. People are, we're afraid. And, and they need to, to have that reassurance that, you know, we really do value the safety and the, um, and the mental health of our staff, right? We don't want burnout. And, 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 and again, how, how do you prevent that? And, you know, what services do you offer to help them not only navigate through this, you know, pandemic, but the changes in their life, in their family's life, because some have lost family due to COVID. Others have you know, great fear because they have elderly uh, family members or perhaps children with uh, disabilities, with the coexisting conditions, that's not going away. Um, and, and just managing you know, uh, like childcare. And so our ability to accommodate and be flexible with staff, uh, as they face these life events, as we all do, and then on top of that, you know, the pandemic and all the changes in terms of the delivery of healthcare services, um, and, and keep them engaged and keep them supported and feeling supported uh, throughout all of this and retain them uh, has, has really been a challenge. You know, we have staff that have not come back from workflow. Uh, uh, furlough because of you know these problems and uh thank goodness you know we have the majority of our staff there we're able to recruit that's also though difficult because we have competition from bigger hospital systems that are offering more money for you know openings that they face as well right they have shortages so you're looking at shortages throughout healthcare and um, the wages have gone up uh, and, you know, find, again, finding people who are staff that are going to align not only with the mission of the organization, but have the passion to serve our vulnerable populations and feel like they are being blessed to be in this uh, walk of life and work. That's what we want. And that's what we keep striving for and then how do we support them, keep them engaged uh, and, and, and accommodate for their needs as well. Thank you so much. And um, well, we have some few minutes for question and answers and I'm going to need to get back to, to Fide. Uh, Fide, do we have any questions either through Zoom or through Facebook for Zara? Uh, not at the moment. <laughs> All right, uh, in the meantime, uh, I, just, I would like to remind everyone to please complete the post evaluation survey. Your information is very valuable and uh, we'll always like to hear from you as well in order to improve our training and technical assistance activities. This is our contact information. Again, if you would like to uh, access this, uh, this uh, conversation, uh, you can go to our website, you can go to our Facebook page. And uh, in, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to have uh, another conversation similar to this one with Dr. Marcellian in the next few weeks that is gonna focus specifically on the workforce and all the issues of recruitment and retention during COVID. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, Fide, any, uh, any, any questions? No, no. I'm okay. Not. All right, Zara. 
thank you so much for your time, for your uh, for sharing your experience, your challenges, and thank you for everything that you're doing for your community, for your patients, and thank you to La Maestra and the staff who are really working hard to provide the, the all the primary uh, health services to the population in San Diego. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciated this opportunity. Thank See you, you next time. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.